Good morning, and welcome to this Hangout for the World Economic Forum 2013. I'm Cristiana Falcone from the World Economic Forum, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this Hangout with the Chair of the Board of Directors of Transparency International, Uget Labelle. Welcome, Uget. Good morning. Also joining us from around the world, we have some of the World Economic Forum Global Shapers, young thinkers and entrepreneurs, and they're all under the age of uh, 30s. And we'll be taking questions from there. They're from all over the world. This is going to be exciting. Absolutely. Look what technology <laughs> allows us to do. Great. Amazing. First, I want to ask you a question, Uget. Um, Transparency International is described as one global movement with a vision of a world in which government, business, civil society, and the daily lives of people are free of corruption. Can you tell me more about this work? What do you mean with that? Absolutely. And what you want to achieve? And also how this um, as an influence or an impact on what we're doing here in Davos. Absolutely. Well, uh, good morning, uh, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm very pleased to have the chance to uh, di have this discussion with you. And I wish you were in Davos, but we met yesterday with some of the other young shapers who are here. Um, to get to your question, uh, I think that it, it's evident today that wherever we look, uh, whatever you want to achieve, if you do not deal with corruption, uh, you will not get rid of the turbulence of our time. You'll not get rid of abject poverty because money gets stolen uh, by leaders and put in outside of countries. But we will also not have the kind of planetary security that we need, as well as community uh, security, violence, uh, very often comes out of corruption because corruption feeds violence, it feeds civil conflict. So to us, it's, it's essential uh, in order to meet, for example, the next goals after the MDGs of 2015. It's vital in terms of ensuring that young people all have access to professional and technical education. Because if money is not there, is taken out of the treasuries of our countries, uh, you will not have the resources available to be able to uh, provide the social infrastructure like schools and, and uh, uh, health clinics and transportation, which we all need in terms of having sustainable livelihoods. We were talking about resilience at this yes. World Economic Forum meeting. Um, what are the pillars for that in today's reality? You know, what I find interesting at this Davos is that uh, you hear more and more of the leaders and, of course, people like me and others saying, if we want to be resilient in the future in preventing some of the major turbulence of our time, as well as deal with them, because some of them will come, then we need to put into our way forward the foundation of some essential values. Essential values of transparency, of integrity, of inclusiveness, of openness, of accountability. And if you have these as for governments, for the public sector, for the private sector, then I think you can build in something which will be very different because it's going to be integrity before political expediency. It should be integrity uh, before profits. How do you make it happen? I think that there are many ways, of course, that we need to have. But we need to have much greater inclusiveness and participation in decision making uh, by our societies, by the people. And to me, in particular, young people and women. And that is part of the inclusive aspect. Because if you don't have that, then uh, you, did, you get a disconnect between the leaders and what the people need and the people want. Yeah. So we've got to find, and this happens from local government right up to the national level. And there are some interesting examples of what some of the things that have happened uh, in the last while. Okay, I would like now to take some of the questions from Great. our global shaper. And I think there are much better questions than the one I've been asking you so far. <laughs> so now I'd like to take some questions from our uh, global shaper, Arunduti Gupta, who is in Bangalore. Uh, founder Hi. and CEO of Mentor Together in India. Hello, Arun Dutti. How are you? Hi, I'm doing really well. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Do you have a question for Get? 
Yes, you get. Uh, so I ran a youth mentoring organization in, in Bangalore and I was fortunate to be at the WEF summit that happened in India where um, the, uh, the comptroller and the auditor general of India who uh, made some very, very honest remarks about how the government in India has been essentially running roughshod over uh, account and accountability initiatives and mechanisms. And uh, while it was lauded a lot at the India summit, he got into a lot of trouble as soon as he left the summit. So uh, given that having independent audit mechanisms is so important, what are your thoughts around uh, empowering them more in countries like India where the government often overrules them? Of course. Well, first of all, I think in all governments, uh, these oversight institutions are vital because it's a way of holding the government to account on behalf of the people. Uh, so okay. what you need uh, for these audit agencies is for them to be fully independent from the government and to have all of their work published and be, be public, available to the press, available to the people and that in turn they do follow-up audits and publish that in terms of what has been done with their recommendation. If the recommendations are there and nothing happens, then of course uh, people become very cynical. So I think that this is a very important role and where you have, for example, anti-corruption commissions as you do in some countries, as well as auditors general, uh, then you have again another mechanism to try to uh, ensure that um, there is no impunity in the country. Did that answer your question? Yeah. So let's move from India to Ecuador. Hola, Carolina. Okay, Carolina, I think Ecuador, it's, it's not morning there, okay. so maybe there is something. Okay. <laughs> so we have so many countries. I think I will, uh, let me see which one I like now. Africa, Harare, can I go to Harare and talk to Albert Mabunga? Albert, good morning. Good morning, how are you guys doing? Very well, how are you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored, eh? <laughs> Albert is the founder and president, I'll let you guess because you can see, looking at him, of a Smile for Africa. I know. Look, what a wonderful smile. So, Albert, what is your question for Uget? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for all the work that you do, Uget. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, but I believe, along with Smile for Africa, that education is the number one tool to conquer things like corruption, poverty, uh, and eventually increase the economies of different countries. So what are you doing to improve education across Africa? Because if I understand what needs to be done by being educated, then my chances of being deprived of my rights and my benefits will be reduced. So what are you doing? Okay, well, first of all, uh, uh, let me say that I was in your country just before Christmas and uh, had yes. the chance in Harare because I'm on the board of the Africa Capacity Building Foundation, which is headquartered in, in Harare, uh, as well as Transparency International. And, well, I, what we have done in Transparency International is we have done a survey in Africa of a number of countries to see uh, how, what were the impediments to having well-performing schools. And what we found is that in too many places, the parents have to bribe uh, the teachers for the teachers to come to work, or have to bribe for uh, the children to be <coughs> able to have access to the school. And, but it's especially uh, also that what we found is that, that the parents uh, are not invited in to the school to uh, work with the teachers to ensure that uh, the teachers, first of all, are there, come to teach, but also that there is no disconnect between the education system and the communities where you are. So that's one aspect. But I'm just coming out of a session at Davos here when we were looking at what happens after the MDGs. And of course, we were all asked to put down uh, some some of our recommendations. One or two of mine uh, were on education for young people around the world. And to me, one of them uh, has to be that all young people, boys and girls, must have access to professional and tertiary education. 
uh, you know, the, tech, to the technical and professional education because they, young people then will be able to create the jobs, not only for themselves, but for others. And they will be, uh, they will be the pool of human resource that's, that we all need. We have a disconnect right now. You have countries, or even sometimes in most countries, a demand for certain technical uh, skills, and you have a whole lot of people unemployed at the same time. So that we need to, to ensure that through education, young people are able to really take their place in our society because we need them. We need the energy, we need their savviness in terms of social media, we need the fact that they come with hope and different ways of looking at some of our issues of our time. Albert, did this make you smile, but in the right way? To some extent, but I, I see where she's going with this. You should give me a referral to your headquarters in Harare, and I think we can work <laughs> something out. <laughs> okay. I'd be interested in, in his comments and what, what he thinks is missing here. Albert, what do you think is missing in her answer? Um, Okay. You mentioned that there is, there is bribery when it comes to teachers coming to school. Uh, to be honest, the case for Africa is really complex. Um, you find out the civil servants, the teachers, do not get paid at the right time, if they even get paid. So you find parents needing to give them incentives to come to school. Now, what happens to those parents who cannot afford to give the teachers incentives? Their children are deprived of education. So if maybe some structure or some incentives could come from from those who have who can give aid to to pay teachers and uh relieve the governments of their struggles of not affording to pay their own citizens maybe uh we'll have an increase in enrollment and increase in teachers attending schools Okay, what do you I, think? I, this is great because uh, I, I think there, is, there was another dimension to the work that we did. And some of the things that we are pressing for is on one hand for governments and the development agencies from outside of Africa who cooperate with governments to follow the money, to follow the disbursements from the national government or from the development agencies all the way to the school. Because right. what we find is a lot of it gets lost, uh, either because of mismanagement or because of, of bribery or because of people stealing those, this money. Because yes. indeed, the teachers have to be paid and the schools Definitely. have to be built. So your point is a very important one. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Albert. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move from Africa to St. Petersburg. Oh. Or no, I'm not moving to. I love this like uh, world tour. Oh, Olga, yes, Olga. Uh -huh. It's unbelievable. I really, it, it's incredible. You know, in the old days, before you could make a connection, and now everybody's there. Hello, Olga. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Very well. We um, we are here with Uget, and uh, we are looking forward to listen to your question. Or Olga is the founder of Fair, of volunteering option in St. Petersburg. Olga, please. Your question. Uh, Co-founder, actually, but it uh, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> my question will be about um, when I'm thinking about the corruption uh, in the country that I am living in. Uh, it's a huge issue and uh, we even, I, I even don't want to start it. <laughs> but what I'm thinking is that um, the most important thing or the thing that I can make or people can make, it's a sort of awakeness uh, in the population to know the, the, to understand the idea of what happening, uh, and for sure I totally agree that education is an amazing way. Uh, my question is only how, since we do have the educational system which hasn't changed years in Russia, and actually it's the same, pretty same thing uh, in other countries. We do have the education system which built like before internet and before everything. So my question is more about tools that we uh, can use uh, to make the awareness, to make sort of PR understanding uh, for this issue. Absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, this is very good because, you know, we have focused a lot in the past on trying to get at the national level uh, the systems, the regulations, the laws, uh, having a justice system 
that works. It doesn't always work very well in all countries, but still. And what we realize is that it doesn't trickle down. It doesn't trickle down, first of all, to local government level where people live. And so we have to have a much more directed impact on how local governments work with the people. Now, at the other end, what we're also uh, realizing is that unless the people begin to say no to impunity, and I think in Russia we have seen this now more recently, um, and that uh, used, and they use the social media, and young people are capable of doing that better than anybody else, and they are. Um, you know, for example, we were talking earlier here about India, where there's a, a new movement uh, where uh, people who are asked to pay a bribe are reporting it, you know, putting it on the web uh, and saying, you know, I was asked to pay a bribe, so, for example. So I think that the use of social media to bring about a different kind of participation of the people in, in pressing for those changes that you're talking about, because you're right, the education system was built before we had internet, and we still have the old way of providing education, which can be so different if one were to use the internet and what's available now. So my, my response is always to say, um, I think that people like you have already started to do something. Uh, a number of young people have started their own social enterprise, uh, have, have teamed up together uh, and gone sometimes to a local government and say, we want in. We don't want to be out anymore. Now, not easy to do, always sometimes impossible to get a reaction, but I would say, please do not despair, because when, you know, I always say despair is worse than hope, and, uh, and I think that you can use social media in a very interesting way to try to bring about change, and the kind of change you're talking about, which is vital. Olga, can you do it in your country, or do you find barriers there? Uh, no, uh, I can do it, like for now, I can do it. Um, <laughs> the question is uh, what, what, where it's going. Uh, but my question more uh, that, you know, before, uh, like social media, it's a tool for sure. Uh, but my question is that, you know, we can uh, talk theoretically about uh, uh, um, people who will come to the government. Uh, but we need, you know, it's dialogue, so we need the government be ready that somebody will come. Uh, so. And th this dynamic in Russia uh, very questionable. I would put it this of way. Course. Of course. I wish I'd listened to this question two days ago when we were with President Medvedev, next time Prime Minister. I, we, I <laughs> wish that I had uh, the option to ask. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> it was very interesting. Um, um, at that session uh, where the Prime Minister of Russia was, uh, there was a, a voting in the hall, and there were five questions. And, you know, there was one on the financial aspect, and a number of them were technical. But there was also one on dealing with corruption and governance. And something like 77% of the people, you know, said what needs to happen in Russia is to deal with governance and corruption, which is right up to your point here. But it was very interesting because this were a few thousand people in this room. Um, just before the uh, Prime Minister Medvedev spoke. So, uh, thank you very much, Olga, and thank you for all you are doing. Ah, thank you. Now I can go back to Europe, so we can uh, see whether there is a disparity at the regional level, whether corruption is only a problem affecting emerging economies, or whether in Europe we are dealing with the same things. And we are here with Take Cohen, yeah. who is um, a university lecturer and a lawyer at Baker and McKenzie. Cohen, over to you. Question for Get. Hello, good morning. Thank you so good much for, for being with us and for sharing your valuable insights. Um, I'm wondering, what do you see basically um, since its foundation about 20 years ago? Uh, Transparency International has already reached a, a lot uh, of its objectives, but what do you see as the main objectives going forward in 2013 and beyond for Transparency International? Very good. I think that our issues now are first, uh, you know, enforcement of the laws and the regulations that are there. Because in many countries, the legal framework is present, but its enforcement is not there. Or the institutions for the enforcement are weak. Um, 
secondly, I think what we see also is, as we were saying just before uh, with Olga, that uh, we need to find much better ways of having people participate uh, in planning, uh, in, in budgetary planning, as well as program planning and oversight than we have had until now. We need new ways of doing that. And this is a way of holding governments to account. Okay? We, and we're also pressing much now, we're bringing industry and the private sector much more into the fold. Because to the extent that industries, especially the extractive industries, disclose what they pay to governments, disclose where their subsidiaries are located. Are they all in fiscal havens, evading taxes? Uh, and are they, you know, who are the owners? Are some of the subsidiaries become a way of laundering money, uh, which is stolen money from other parts of the world? So I think we, we are moving now more towards, first of all, local government level, which, which is the next frontier. Secondly, enforcement of laws, regulation, better systems, better funding. And thirdly, to reach out to the people directly. And we have started a campaign of reaching out to the people and working more with young people and the education system to build ethics back into, into the curriculum of the schools from kindergarten right up to postdoc. Cool, I have a, a question for you. In your practice and when you teach, how can you translate the message that we just here from get in uh, daily instruction or notion for your <laughs> student, but also action where you practice your law. Well, I believe, uh, especially the comment about the enforcement is very valuable. I believe we have very good uh, systems in place, but sometimes there is a lack of uh, enforcement, and that's what we really um, still try to, uh, yeah, should work on, basically, and that's also what I would try to achieve. Great. I wanted to go, if possible, uh, back to Get and ask you, uh, I introduced uh, Cohen saying uh, that the problem of corruption is not a problem that affects only emerging markets, of course. Um, or what uh, somehow we call still, uh, with these hot terms, a developing world, right? Because actually when you see certain dynamics, some of the main uh, corruption hubs are actually in the uh, emerge or industrialized country. Absolutely. Can you say something about that? Uh, well, thank you, because um, you know, I'm often asked that question. Is corruption an issue of the developing world? Of course it's not. Uh, it is not because we, if we look at our own countries, what we find very often is issues of collusion. You know, where, because we have big construction projects, we have big procurement by government uh, at all levels. And unless this is done there, with much greater openness and transparency than it is today in most of our countries, then what you find is that there's collusion. There is still money being put under the table to get contracts. And this increases the cost of constructing, for example, our transportation system, energy, water, uh, etc., uh, in a way that uh, the taxpayers have to pay for that corruption. And the other part of our, our Western societies is that we still have too many of our companies who when they do business in developing countries uh, are more than ready to offer a bribe. Of course, some of them face extortion uh, and requests for bribes, and some of them walk away or say we're a zero tolerance. And what we're doing is working with those leaders of industry uh, who decided that a clean business is better business uh, and at the end, they make better profits if they are uh, w if they have a clean business and do not have a zero tolerance to corruption. So when we look at our own countries, we also have to be much more critical than we have been. And I always say um, to the governments, you know, you are only the custodians of the people's resources, of the people's money and of the people's information. And I think that this is where the transparency becomes so important. Thanks to our guest to get, Thank and you. thanks to our global shaper from all around the world. The, it was an honor. It was an honor moderating this debate yeah. because of this insight and also because all of you make the effort from your faraway places to connect with us and open up. And um, thanks to the studio here. This wasn't easy, but we yeah. made it happen. I'm Cristiana Falcone, and this was the World Economic Forum and GAUT.